Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to uh, to ICCF at Columbia Business School. Uh, this is Adam Ring, and uh, I'm joined by my colleague Shelley Lombard. Hi, Shelley. Hello, everyone. Um, so we're happy to be here today. Um, you know, I wanted to. Uh, you know, first, I think many of you got to know um, Shelley in the in the forums. Uh, as you can tell, she's a a real expert. Uh, we're lucky to have her as a TA. Uh, I know she provided some background of her uh, 25 years of experience um, in the industry, um, but I'd also point out that uh, Shelley has done um, extensive uh, training at, at places like Goldman Sachs and, and, and Morgan Stanley for the new hire trainings, and um, you know is really one of the experts uh, you know in this field of explaining these concepts. So we're we're lucky to have you, Shelley. Thanks for being here. Oh, glad to be here. Um, and what, what we'll do today is really, you know, this, I know, uh, you know, everyone is, is probably busy um, on the uh, wrapping up the case study. Hopefully you guys, are, uh, at least some of you have finished it. Um, for those you're, you're wrapping up, uh, good luck with it. Um, and so next week we're going to uh, have the grading component of that and we'll send you some information on Monday about that. Um, and, um, you know, for today, this is really just an extra, um, extra session. Uh, you know, we, we have a, um, you know, situation with, with Toys R Us, which Shelly will, will walk through, which is, um, you know, I think most of you know, uh, you know, largest, uh, at one point largest uh, toy retailer uh, in the United States. And just yesterday, um, they announced that they're closing um, all the stores. So it's, you know, unfortunate story, um, but it's timely. And, and, you know, what we want to do in this course is use uh, current events um, to uh, help teach the concepts. And so you can apply them uh, to your jobs and to your, to your career. So we thought we'd, you know, take this opportunity to, uh, for Shelly to kind of walk through this case and, uh, and um, go from there. So in terms of format, Shelly's going to go through some prepared comments. And uh, after that, uh, she'll be available for a sub Q and A. So over to you, Shelley. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay. How does this work here? Um, here we go. All right. Is that it? Yep. That's it. Can you guys see it? Uh, yeah, you're on slide four, but we can see it. Okay. Yep. Sorry about that. That's okay. There we go. All right. All righty. So um, today we're going to uh, recap a little bit of what you've learned. I'm going to integrate some examples just from my career, my experience. Just brief recap. I went to Columbia um, and then joined Citibank's Leverage Buyout Group, where I it was kind of the heyday of leverage buyouts because the market had just crashed in October of 87. So of course I'm dating myself, but stock prices were low, interest rates were still relatively low, and so it was kind of a feeding frenzy for private equity firms. So I worked on deal after deal after deal after deal. Uh, then I went to Drexel Burnham Lambert uh, doing high yield, specifically high yield commercial paper. That whole group reported to Mike Milken, who was kind of a legend then, and you know everybody since then has forgotten who he is because that's been years ago. And then spent the la the next like 25 years of my career going back and forth between the buy side and the sell side. I worked at a hedge fund. I ran a proprietary trading desk at Barclays, and then I also worked um, as a, a, a high yield automotive analyst, um, you know, covering auto uh, credits. And my distress background, because that was kind of the expertise I developed, it came in handy because as you you know may recall in the mid 2000s the whole auto industry kind of went to hell in a handbasket for lack of a better word GM filed and a lot of its suppliers filed I think at one point I was covering maybe 40 names and maybe 25 of them were either in bankruptcy or headed that way so it was a really tumultuous time but you know a great time to get a lot of experience and learn a lot of stuff etc so I'm gonna pull one or two of those um, give you a chance to ask questions um, I probably shouldn't answer questions on the case, but we can definitely talk conceptually if you have any questions about important concepts, et cetera. Um, and so let, let's get started. So the topics we're gonna cover today, um, the scissors effect, analyzing revenue and cost trends. So unit price, volume, contribution market margin and how it played into uh, one particular deal that I was working on. EBITDA, um, this was something that really was kind of a theme last cycle, but I think it's important enough I wanna hit it again, which is EBITDA, 
the usefulness and what it doesn't capture. We obviously reiterated it this cycle, but I don't think we talked a lot. There weren't a lot of questions in the a forum about adjusted EBITDA, but I just thought I would talk about that concept a little bit because it's important. Working capital, there was just a question just last night about working capital and why negative working capital can be good. And then there have always been questions about what's the appropriate leverage for a company. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And if I have time, I'll talk about debt versus equity. Not quite as, as important. But let's get started. So Goodyear was one of the, the automotive names that I was working on in kind of the mid, mid-2000s. mid And just let me say, you know, we had a discussion, um, and I listened to all the live sessions in, uh, I think it was live session number one, about disclosure and the lousy disclosure in the state. States. Um, and, you know, it's really hard, and the professor is so correct, it's really hard to calculate things like break even because they don't give you enough disclosure. I think some of that is for competitive reasons. Um, you know, I, like, I don't know if you've ever listened to an earnings call, but I list, have listened to way more of them than I care to. Um, and so when you get on the call, you know, they have you register, you have your name, where you're calling from, and, um, you know, like on General Motors call, they were really conscious that competitors might be on. So I think, I don't know why there isn't that same sensitivity to the issue in other parts of the world, but I think in the U.S., a lot of the disclosure, I noticed on the conference calls, they're very careful about what they say and what they disclose and just kind of, I won't say they screen people out of listening to the conference calls because you can always get a transcript later, but they're very careful. They're always conscious of, are my competitors listening? But on the call, when they do take questions, sometimes you can hear analysts trying to get at that issue of what your fixed cost is because they're kind of trying to get an idea of contribution margin. So if you're ever serious about a company, you know, you're looking at the stock for yourself or something like that, I would encourage you, you can get a transcript on Seeking Alpha, uh, if you're a member of Seeking Alpha, and to read the conference call because a lot of the stuff that they don't cover in the disclosure, at least in the U.S., is something sometimes analysts will push for on the phone call, on the earnings call, and they, you know they're four years, so it's a good opportunity to get some extra information, and it's all public because you know the world is on the call and then it's published afterward. So with Goodyear, they had 30% of their revenue from uh, tires on new vehicles, and 70% of their revenue came from replacement tires, which I was like, oh, I didn't realize that, but that makes sense. So you think about how long you keep your vehicle and the fact that along the way, you've got to replace the tires. So this was a period kind of in the early to mid-2000s. The unit volume, um, their unit volume due to new cars was down, just, just because auto sales were down due to the economy, people were starting to get nervous about about house prices, et cetera. And then also their unit volume of, on replacement tires was down. Interestingly enough, and I never made this connection before I started covering Goodyear, their replacement tire volume is linked to gas prices. So if gas prices are high, people try to avoid driving, you know, they carpool, they take public transportation, and so they don't put a lot of wear and tear on their tires. And tires are not something, it's not really a discretionary purchase. You don't go out, wake up one Saturday and go like, oh, I'm going to go shopping for tires. It's like, oh my God, I need tires. So let me go buy tires. So, you know, it's certainly tied to gas prices because you are not going to replace your tires until you have absolutely have to. You just don't want to bother. So the fact that gas prices during this period of time, oil prices were up. I think this must have been around the time where oil was 90 bucks a barrel and gas prices were high. And so people were driving fewer miles. So what you really saw was unit volume coming down. In addition to that, because of oil prices, Goodyear's costs were going up. Oil um, is a, a big component in making synthetic rubber. So their, their costs were going up and their unit the volume was going down. Definitely a scissor effect. Now, you didn't see it as much because they were able to pass their costs on to customers. Because tires are a non-discretionary purchase, if you need them, you got to buy them. Heaven forbid you have a blowout, you get stuck in the snow because you don't have enough you know, tread or traction on your tires, so you have to buy them. So Goodyear and everybody else in the industry was passing on their higher rubber prices, but the unit volume was down. So you saw you know, their costs go up by the price of rubber, their revenue go up, but, you know, so the prices of the tires were going up, but the unit volume was going down. So they were in, they were in trouble. Um, 
management had plans to kind of turn the situation around. Goodyear had a huge um, you know, pension expense, which is one of the things that's not included in EBITDA, and it runs through the cash flow statement, so contributions to the pension plan. And so they were really, really struggling. What helped them was this, and this is how they avoided bankruptcy. Um, they took it, it, what they tried to do is to replace the falling volume, I, I, and they tried successfully, was replace declining volume with better mix. And what I mean by that is this, you know, what one of the questions you ask yourself when you analyze a company is what's their most profitable product and what drives sales of that product? Well, in Goodyear and pretty much every tire company's case, it was high performance tires. So in other words, you know, tires for SUVs, tires that um, performed under extreme circumstances. So I think it was good if I remember correct, correctly, I'm reaching back now in my memory 10 or 12 years, but that introduced the run flat tire. So you know, they had these commercials where you know, you're driving on this lonely dark highway with your family, with two, two kids in the back of the car and you get a flat, you know, heaven forbid, you gotta get on the side of the road in this, you know, in this dark, desolate area and change a tire. The run flat tire would continue to run. It would take you another, I forget it was 50 miles or something, so you could get to the next gas station safely. Um, and so what they did was they couldn't get unit volume up, but what they did was they got price up. When you came into the dealership to buy your tire, they would upsell you, basically convince you to buy the more expensive tire, which made all the sense in the world from a safety perspective. And so they were able to offset the impact of declining volume with declining unit volume with a better mix is what they they called it in other words higher price units not everybody was you know scaling up everybody couldn't afford to but if you could afford to you said oh yeah that totally makes sense you know i want to run flat tire and in that way those guys were able to um to, to avoid bankruptcy. The bonds were stressed. They were kind of in the 80s and the stock was single digits. I think it got as low as $4 or something like that. But in, in other words, what they did was they increased the contribution margin. So I don't know what their fixed costs were, even though I followed the company for a number of years, analysts were never able to figure that out. But you know, the, the contribution margin on a, a more expensive tire is going to be higher than it is on a cheaper tire. And so that's basically what they did. Um, that enabled the company to increase revenue. They paid down debt. You know, they got their house in order and they actually never had to file bankruptcy. Uh, General Motors, I want to talk about just for a minute, same time frame. Um, this was, and I think Goodyear was kind of scissor effects scenario one. This was kind of scissor effects scenario three. These guys went from investment grade to high yield to bankruptcy. Uh, I picked up coverage of them from the investment grade analyst and started covering them and followed them all the way to, to bankruptcy. As I mentioned with Goodyear, their new vehicle sales were down due to the economy. But the interesting thing is high gas prices also impacted them as well. Um, they might have been able to survive the weak economy, but what happened is their contribution margin from their vehicles went down and let me explain for years General Motors Ford and Chrysler had really been surviving because of SUVs so if you think about it and they never disclose this but if you think about two things it doesn't take that much more manpower to put together to assemble an, uh, an SUV or a truck than it does a car everybody all of them have bumpers all of them have transmissions you know etc it's it's more materials but the man hours was involved are not that much more but an SUV might might sell for 50, 60 grand, whereas a Ford Focus might, might sell for 25 grand. So the contribution margin on that, um, on that SUV or that truck is a lot fatter, uh, and it helps to cover your fixed costs. Second thing is GM, Ford, all those guys had very high fixed costs, inflexible. So fixed costs can be somewhat flexible over time, but they had uh, union contracts which said, you know, if you decide if Saturn, which was an old brand, wasn't selling well and you wanted to close a Saturn plant, you had to give the workforce two years notice. Um, if you had a certain amount of seniority and you got laid off, they had to give you two years worth of work before they could actually, you know, lay you off. Um, nice work if you could get it, because basically what they would do is just sit you in a room and you could study, kind of go back to school, do other things, but those costs were locked in for another two years. So it was a very expensive, their wage rate was high, 
um, pension plan, generous pension plans that the company had agreed to, you know, back when it was making a lot of money. Uh, a lot of benefits were for retirees, plus the somewhat inflexible cost structure. They really needed contribution margin. So that's why they rode SUVs, they rode trucks as long as they could. But when gas prices went up and people switched to cars and hybrids, that's really what took them down. So they ended up being able to restructure um, or not being able to restructure. They had to restructure. They started figuring it out. And really, the gas prices were the thing that really kind of made the wheels come off their bus for them. Um, and it forced their hand. They should have restructured years ago. But what happened was they ran out of liquidity and they ran out of time. So in other words, they started closing uh, plants, really closing. They sold, I think Ford owned Jaguar. They sold Jaguar. I think GM had Saturn. They closed that. They narrowed down their number of quote unquote quote, nameplates, so they didn't have to spend advertising dollars advertising all of these different brands. And so they started to bring their costs down. But in GM's case, Ford didn't. But in GM's case, they just ran out of money. Quite frankly, they needed, I think the company said, oh, I think, I think it was $15 billion was the minimum cash they had to have at any one time in order to support their operations worldwide. And so at one point they had 40 and it just kept coming down and they got a bailout from the government, but it wasn't enough to stop them from needing to go into bankruptcy to restructure all their obligations. So that was just another example of contribution margin and fixed costs and how they all play in together. That stuff about the SUVs and the higher contribution margin of SUVs and trucks, analysts like myself just figured it out. The company never disclosed it. You didn't have any information. If you asked them on a call, they would be very cagey about it. Because who wants to admit? I mean, the, the what people thought is that they were losing money on every car that they sold. Not only did it have minimal contribution margin, it had negative contribution margin. But they had all these people they had to employ. And if you got to give them two years' notice, you might as well keep pumping pumping out the cars anyway. I mean, what's the, what's the point? So, um, you know, I guess that goes back to the disclosure. They never disclosed that probably for competitive reasons, but analysts kind of figured out, although the company never confirmed it. So let's look at EBITDA and some of the limits of EBITDA. So usually what I do to calculate EBITDA is to take reported operating income, add back all the recurring items that are non-cash. So that's like depreciation, amortization, things that recur every quarter, every year, add that back. And uh, most people call that EBITDA. And then analysts usually add back all the non-recurring items that are non-cash or the non-recurring items that are cash. So in other words, anything that impacted earnings on a one-time basis, that could be asset impairments, that could be severance, that could be you know, one-time litigation, anything like that to get you from EBITDA to adjusted EBITDA was pretty much how, what people call it. So let's look at, um, yep, Toys R Us. So here, you know, and just so you know, EBIT and EBIT, I'm sorry, uh, yes, EBIT and EBITDA are really a non-GAAP measure. Companies call EBIT operating income, so it's pretty much the same. But EBITDA in the U.S. is a non-GAAP measure. So in other words, um, accounting standards don't require you to report EBITDA. Um, it's something that analysts came up with. A lot of high-yield companies report it anyway because they know analysts look for it. And so if there are any one-time items like severance or asset impairments that are in impacting their earnings, they want to make sure that you know that this is something that's one time and that their EBITDA actually is a lot higher than it appears because of these one-time charges. Um, if they disclose it, sometimes, let's see, of the companies that disclose, and I would say probably 90% of high-yield companies actually calculate EBITDA for you. You may not always agree with the calculation, but they calculate it for you and present it. And then of those companies that do it, probably about 75% of them um, do it. Maybe half of them uh, present it in the, the uh, public financial state the 10K, the 10Q, et cetera, and the other half just put it in their earnings report. So if you're ever looking for EBITDA for a company, you don't see it in the 10K, it's not required to be there. But if you go to their website, Investor Relations, and look for their earnings release, their quarterly earnings release, if they calculate EBITDA for you, it'll be in there. And it'll be in a section usually toward the end of the release that says non-GAAP measures. So this is Toys R Us. This is their you know, operating income. 
Um, and um, I don't think they filed in January of this year. So this is really last year's financial statements is for the year ended. The most recent one is the year ended 2017. But I just kind of wanted to look at the trend. This is EBITDA. Um, you know, we add back DNA to get to EBITDA and then all of these one time, you know, kind of funky items to get to uh, adjusted or clean EBITDA. Now, let's just reiterate. EBITDA or adjusted EBITDA is not a proxy for cash flow. It's a convenient thing for analysts to use, but most analysts realize it's not a proxy for cash flow. It's useful for valuation because, you know, free cash flow or uh, cash from operations varies every quarter because of working capital, et cetera. Um, so it's not helpful to use it for valuation because it's kind of like all over the place. It varies. Um, and it's not... Um, and EBITDA, though, is good for valuation. It's not sufficient for financial analysis. So you really want to look at cash flow or free cash flow. So EBITDA is not a proxy for that, but it is very useful for valuation because it's kind of standard. You know, it doesn't incorporate CapEx, which free cash flow does. It doesn't incorporate working capital, which can swing wildly sometimes from year to year. So typical credit ratios, we've talked about this in the class, EBITDA to interest expense. Somebody asked about EBIT to interest expense, and that's common as well. Uh, one iteration of that is EBITDA minus CapEx to interest expense. Because if you, you think DNA is kind of a proxy for CapEx, if CapEx about equals you know, DNA, then you can use EBIT to interest expense rather than EBITDA to interest expense. It's more, more realistic, even though neither one of them is a proxy for cash flow. And then leverage, you have debt to EBITDA. And someone asked why you would use EBIT for interest coverage and EBITDA for leverage. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And it's really because if you take the debt to EBITDA and you say, you know, it's five times and uh, companies in that industry are trading at seven times EBITDA, you can really quickly figure out whether your debt is covered or not. Um, and so that's why debt to EBITDA is a more common ratio. I don't think I ever see debt to EBIT. It's really debt to EBITDA. EBITDA, and that's because EBITDA is something that's used for valuation. So again, EBITDA and the ratios that use EBITDA don't capture these things. And I just want to reiterate it because it's really one of the key points of the course and the key points in the life of an analyst. It doesn't capture cash taxes. It doesn't capture working capital. It doesn't capture CapEx. It doesn't uh, capture non-recurring cash expenses. So for example, if GM lays off a bunch of people and and has to pay severance to a lot of workers, that gets added back to EBITDA, adjusted EBITDA, because it's a one-time item. But really, you can't judge the company's liquidity adequately because that's actual cash going out the door. It may not reoccur next year, but still this year, you need to account for it. You need to understand why cash might be low this year because they had all this one-time expense. And it doesn't capture pension contributions. So when I took over General Motors, I looked at the numbers, and they had not generated any um, sufficient free cash flow for years. Uh, one of the reasons was pension contributions, tons of money going out the door to fund an underfunded pension plan. And I thought, why is this thing even investment grade? Because they were not generating enough cash from operations to cover the massive amounts of CapEx that they needed to support the business. So they were really making up that shortfall by going to the capital markets and borrowing. Or at that time, they owned their own finance company. So they were making up the shortfall because they were, you know, lending and making a great spread between what they were, you know, how they were borrowing because they were investment grade and what they were lending to people. You know, they were borrowing at some really low number lending it to people so people could buy cars and making the spread. That's really what they were making the money on. So what you really want to do as an analyst is go from EBITDA to cash from operations to free cash flow, which is really the thing. And here it is in the case of uh, Toys R Us. So Toys R Us, you take the clean EBITDA and you have all of these things, you know, you could see what they were spending their money on and you can see the deterioration in cash from operations. Um, you know, it, it, a lot of it was due to EBITDA deterioration, but you can really see the deterioration in cash from operations. Um, skip that. And then here's Toys R Us, their free cash flow. Again, this doesn't capture the most recent year, but um, 
you know, it, it, you get uh, get an idea of the trend. Here's Toys R Us and their networking capital. One of the things I want to reiterate is that it's the change in operating working capital. Most of you guys seem to have gotten that. That's always a tough concept for people. I remember, and I'll just tell this quick story. When I was first went to Columbia, my first semester, everybody takes what's called baby accounting. And I really struggled with cash flow. Um, I didn't really understand the that it was the change in cash flow and why that was important, why the increase or the decrease in receivables made a difference on your cash balance. And so I remember being up late at night studying for the what we call baby accounting final exam. And I thought, you know what, I really got income statement. I understand appreciation, straight line versus amortization uh, for, versus accelerated. I understand the balance sheet. This cash flow, I don't really get, but I'm going to go in the exam and wing it. So I get into the exam and there are two questions on the exam, only two use this income statement and balance sheet to build the cash flow. And then question number two was explain what you did. Of course, I was like, oh my God, this is like not at all going to work in my favor. But that's the importance of the cash flow that the accounting professor, and I forget who it was, was basically like, look, this boils down to cash flow. Take this in. I don't, don't create an income statement. Don't bother with the balance sheet. I'm going to give them to you. Create a cash flow. So that's really how important cash flow is. And working capital is a huge component of cash flow. So GM definitely had a lot of working capital issues. Their bugaboo was really pension, um, but they definitely had working capital issues. One thing I'm just going to address right now, it came up last night uh, in the forum, why negative working capital is good. I was looking at a company the other day. It was what was called a busted convert. So it's a convertible bond that uh, is, there's no, very little hope that it's going to convert into equity. It's convertible into equity at 39 bucks a share. The stock is currently at $4. So nobody saw that coming. So it's a busted convert. So at any rate, um, the company, but if you look at it, the company and it's the retailer has a lot of inventory, very little receivables, typical in, uh, retailer. They do most of their business and cash or credit card, but lots and lots and lots of inventory. So I looked at it positively because I thought, you know what, if this, this puppy goes under, you can liquidate this inventory and all the debt they really had was a tiny bit of bank debt and this tiny uh, convertible bond. And that's it. So you could really liquidate this inventory because these people have hundreds and hundreds of stores. You could liquidate this inventory and get, get repaid by the liquidation of the inventory. You don't even need the thing to survive. Um, so as a lender or somebody looking at buying the bonds, I like to see plenty of inventory and plenty of receivables, especially if like you're an auto supplier and your receivables are from somebody, you know, at that, at that time, you know, good quality, like, well, still good quality, Toyota or, you know, Nissan or, you know, GM back in the day, that's a great thing. But from a perspective of the company, you really would prefer to owe people, not necessarily tons of debt, but you would prefer to owe your suppliers than to have people owe you. Because while you're waiting for people to pay you what they owe you, uh, like in terms of receivables, uh, like while suppliers were waiting for GM to pay them and they were sitting on all this inventory, they have to keep the lights on. They have to pay payroll. They have to pay benefits. They have to pay all of that stuff. So, you know, we often talk about when I teach during the summer, this concept of, you know, financing your receivables and your inventory. And what that means is while you're waiting for those things to convert to cash, you have to continue to, to pay all your operating expenses. So you would much prefer not to be carrying a lot of receivables, waiting for people to pay you, not to be carrying a lot of of inventory which you're waiting for it to sell um, and really just having people waiting for you to pay them. You don't want to abuse it. We'll talk about that in a second when it comes to Toys R Us, but you really would prefer not to have receivables and inventory and really have you, know, you owing people rather than people owing you. Um, let's just look at Toys R Us. Um, if you look at some of their ratios, I don't use fixed asset turnover a whole lot, but there it is. CapEx to depreciation is very telling. I often use CapEx as a percentage of sales, but if you look at this trend, what it really tells you is what they were spending on CapEx, and this one goes from 2012 to 2017, so it's going you know, that way um, you know, from left to right. Um, you can see what they were spending on CapEx kept declining. So one of the issues with retailers like Neiman Marcus and Bonton stores and you know, is when they get into a bond, Sears definitely, is that they start to spend 
spend less on capital spending. And so the stores look tired. So I haven't been in a Sears in like 20 years, but if you go in, I can't imagine that it looks all spiffy because if you don't spend the money on CapEx, the stores tend to look tired. So that's a, either CapEx to depreciation or CapEx is a percentage of sales. Really the latter is one that analysts use to be able to really compare across the industry and say, you know, these guys should really be spending 3% of sales on CapEx and they're not, it's declining. So the stores look tired. If you look at uh, working capital efficiency, obviously not a lot of days sales outstanding because they get paid in cash or by credit card, but inventory outstanding kept growing and growing and growing. Um, payables, I think was probably the thing that took them down and I'll say this and then I'll kind of move on. Um, with retailers, you have to be really careful, uh, particularly before the Christmas season. You need your supply is to ship because you need product in your stores. More so Toys R Us than, than other types of retailers. But with typical retailers, I would say 60 to 70% of your sales, maybe 50 to 70% comes at Christmas. With Toys R Us, that number was like 80. So the reason they filed in September was they needed to make sure that people ship to them. If you ship to a company that's already filed bankruptcy, you get priority in the court. So when you ship to them, you're definitely going to get paid. And Anybody who shipped to them before they file may not, but if you ship to them after they file, the court makes sure that you get paid. So by filing in September, what Toys R Us was trying to do was save their Christmas. Because as you see, the days payable outstanding kept growing. They were stretching their suppliers. They were like, we'll pay you, we'll pay you, we'll pay you, and they weren't paying them. So suppliers get nervous, and nervous suppliers have driven retailers into bankruptcy. Because what they'll say is, I'm not shipping to you unless it's COD, cash on delivery. So what Toys R Us tried to do by filing bankruptcy was avoid that. So they could say, look, we filed. Anybody who ships to us after we file, they'll automatically get paid because the court mandates that. So that way they could ensure that they had plenty of inventory for Christmas. It didn't help them. Um, the disruption from Amazon and Walmart and Target was just too much for them. Just a minute of background, uh, Toys R Us, I think, did a leverage buyout 10 years ago, and they never really, I think when they did it, like just like iHeartRadio, which I think is either the filing or on the verge of filing, they didn't contemplate the disruption. So when they did the LBO and iHeartRadio, which I think was called Clear Channel at the time, um, was done by a very smart private equity firm. But what happened was they miss they underestimated the disruption from new forms of radio satellite radio from new music sources spotify etc toys r us probably uh, underestimated the disruption from amazon etc and so they were never able to get a handle on their death load a debt load and eventually it led to their demise um and i think one last point i want to make about um and i kind of made it in the beginning i just want to hit it again because it's critical um in terms of what leverage makes sense. Um, it used to be with cable companies, and again, this goes to disruption, that you could pay, you know, um, that you, know, you could highly lever them. They could be really highly leveraged. So this is charter communications. When I was covering cable back at Drexel a gazillion years ago, the thought was cable was kind of like a utility. You move into your apartment, you turn on your lights, you turn on your, your, your heat, you know, you turn on your cable. And so that cable companies could be highly leveraged because they had this annuity stream that would just keep coming. Every month people would pay their cable bills because heaven forbid you'd be without your HBO. Um, and so eventually they could stop laying down cable and they would start to generate cash because CapEx would go down and they could pay down their debt. Well, that never really happened. What happened was that cable companies started to get new competition. Again, disruption from satellite. Now it's cord cutting. People are doing Netflix. They're doing Hulu. They're not checking for cable. So the issue is and also capex never came down because in order to compete with these new entities they had to uh, add data data was unheard of the internet was unheard of when charter first did an lbo and leverage i think it was a leverage acquisition by paul allen who just kind of put a bunch of cable system together but all of that stuff wasn't unheard of cable companies didn't have to provide data they didn't have to provide video on demand they didn't have to provide dvrs none of that existed so capex never came down and new people came into the market. So the combination of disruption caused an issue. So over time, the appropriate leverage will change. Back 10, 20 years ago, 
cable companies could be leveraged, you know, nine times or eight times, even then that was probably high. These days they can't. And again, I just want to point out that the whole leverage thing varies per industry. And a lot of it is based on valuations in the industry. So if you can sell, and that's what happened to radio. Years ago, radio stations traded hands for 12, 15 times EBITDA. Now that they have so many other uh, competitors for people's advertising dollars, you can advertise on mobile, you can advertise just any place. You don't need radio as much. And so now radio companies, are cha- radio entities are trading at in the public market seven to eight times. So what that means is if I've leveraged, if I'm a lender and I've lent a radio operator uh, 10 times EBITDA in terms of debt, that means my debt is probably not covered. If this thing goes into bankruptcy, I'm like out of luck. Um, And so that's why how leverage plays into valuation or valuation plays into leverage. And it also varies according to industry. So if I'm a bank and I'm looking at radio now, what I'm saying is, you know what? I will probably lend maximum of four times EBITDA. Because if this thing goes the wrong way, I could probably sell it for seven times EBITDA or six times and I'll still get my debt covered. So I think that's about it. I've run through this pretty quickly because it was a lot of material and I did want to leave some time for questions. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Shelly. Great job. Uh, let's uh, have some water. Uh, let's uh, let's open Coffee. it up for questions. Coffee, even better? Coffee, yes. <laughs> um, all right. So let's see. Uh, and, and, you know, for everyone out there, if you have questions on um, Shelly's presentation, this is the time to, to do it. Um, uh, Shelly, Christian had a question on interest coverage, um, whether it's calculated as EBIT over interest or EBITDA over interest. You can do it either way. And as I said, the most common is EBITDA to interest expense. Um, but I think EBIT to interest expense uh, also makes sense. It's less common, but it may give you more information. So, for instance, if you think depreciation is you know, CapEx is at least equal to depreciation, which means the company is buying new stuff at the same rate it's depreciating its old stuff, then DA, depreciation, um, which is also amortization, but DA is um, a proxy for CapEx. So by saying EBIT, instead of EBITDA, which you're at least factoring in is the fact that this company has to spend CapEx. So if you just look at EBITDA to interest expense, you're ignoring the need for CapEx. If you look at EBIT, you're kind of in a backhanded way acknowledging that this company can't survive. It can't take all of its EBITDA and spend it on interest expense because it needs to spend something on CapEx. A way that people get around that is what I usually do instead of using EBIT to interest expense, I usually use EBITDA minus CapEx to interest expense because what that captures is, you know, sometimes a company isn't spending all of its depreciation on CapEx. It isn't doing replacement uh, one-to-one. And that's not always necessary. Sometimes like with Home Depot, it like expanded, built and built and built a lot of stores. And so now it's kind of quote unquote in the resting period. So I usually use EBITDA minus CapEx to interest expense, but EBIT is perfectly fine and people will use it because again, DA is kind of a if you assume depreciation equals CapEx and the company is replenishing at the same rate it's, you know, its assets are declining, then if you take out DA and just have EBIT, you've really captured the impact of CapEx. Great. Thanks, Shelley. Um, a question from, from um, uh, r- with regards to uh, contribution margin. Uh, I think if I understand the, the question correctly, it, it relates to, let's say if you look at Home Depot, for example, which has, uh, you know, 600,000 products, um, how do we think about uh, contribution for a company like that? Obviously, you can't go, um, you know, skew by skew. Uh, so so what's, a, what's a reasonable approach as an analyst? Yeah, you know what? I would defer to the professor on that. He, um, in the live session, kind of talked about taking a basket of assets. I'm, I'm sorry, a basket of SKUs and, mm-hmm. um, and approaching it that way. You know, that's a toughie. 
Uh, it really is hard when a company has that many SKUs. It's easier for Goodyear because, you know, you have maybe 20 different types of tires. Um, what I would probably look at with something like that, and I'm fond of doing what's called taking a look at the company's most profitable products and look trying to figure out the contribution margin on that. So, for example, or, or at least taking that into account of my, in my analysis. I may not be able to figure it out, but I can take it into account. So, for instance, since on General Motors, as I said, it didn't take a lot, and again, a lot less SKUs than, than Home Depot, but it didn't take a lot to figure out that the contribution margin on a car or S a car was a lot uh, lower than on an SUV or um, um, a truck, uh, just because there weren't that many. There's some variable costs, a little bit more labor, a little bit more steel and rubber, whatever, but not that much. Um, but I, what I think I would probably do with Home Depot, with all of those 400000 whatever the excuse, probably some subset of them contribute the, the, uh, a lot because it's a higher margin product. So I wouldn't worry about the nails or the lumber or anything like that, even though that's being sold in quantity. I would probably look at what's driving, and I think I had a slide that said this, and let me go back to it. What's driving sales? Uh, what's their most profitable product? and what's driving sales of that most profitable product. So that's not gonna capture everything. It may be um, in Goodyear's case, and it was a certain tire, in GM and Ford's case, it was a certain type of vehicle. In, Good, uh, in Home Depot's case, it might be a certain um, group of products. So it might be their carpets, it might be their appliances, it might be, and so one way to look at it is, this is not going to give you the answer, but what it'll say is, you know, look, um, you know, the, the um, I'm just tr trying to make this up, but plants, their, their greenery presents, you know, gives them the biggest contribution margin. I don't need to know every single item in there, but I know they make the most margin. I figured out or they've acknowledged the fact that they make the most margin on their greenhouse products. So let me think about what impacts the sales of those products. Sometimes that's the only way you can get at it, especially with a company like Home Depot, which has so many SKUs. Again, that won't tell you what the contribution margin is, but if you know that this group of products is their most profitable, and you can think about what drives sales of that group of most profitable products, you can at least get a handle on um, the what could possibly impact their EBITDA. I hope that makes sense. So if somebody thought about the fact that with GM, their, the, their product that was probably the most profitable was, and again, it's not always the same. So with General Motors, SUVs and trucks are very, um, th that was their highest um, price skew. But it also, because you could just think about, you know, what they were spending on labor and materials to build an SUV or a truck versus a car, you could figure out that the contribution margin was the fattest. That's not always the case. Sometimes on your very high-end products, they could have a high variable cost component. But in this case, analysts kind of discussed it and we were like, no, you know what? The contribution margin on those trucks and SUVs is probably high. The difference in variable cost between them and cars is not a lot. So it's not always the case, but very often the case is your most prop, your higher price product is your most profitable product as well. It contributes the most contribution margin. So what you can do is kind of hone down on what impacts um, sales of that product. If analysts had thought about that when General Motors was still high yield and said, you know what? was driving sales of SUVs and, and trucks. And the reason these guys could stay afloat is because low gas prices are really enabling people to buy SUVs and trucks. Then if something happens to gas prices, these guys are going to be in trouble. And that's the kind of analysis I think very often is lacking. I have to say, I don't do it. Not to let myself off the hook. You know, I started covering GM when it was already going this way. But again, you know, that's the kind of thing. Um, in another life, I teach a class called credit red flags and that's one of the things you have to think about these guys are motoring along but you know what forget all 400,000 SKUs let me think about what possibly is their product with the most contribution margin and what's going to impact sales demand for that particular product because if that one goes 
under or that one, you know, starts to, to, to flounder, then we got a problem. So I, I hope that's helpful. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Shelley. Um, let's see. Uh, so can you go to the slide on um, working capital for Toys R Us, please? Yep. Okay. This one. Yeah. Let's take a look here. Um, right. So we had a question about um, Lilac's uh, question is um, that uh, working capital was negative uh, in fiscal year 2015 and 2016, but then it turns positive in 2017. Um, any, any, uh, is there a clear explanation for that? You know what, working capital really varies from year to year. Um, companies do, um, as a professor mentioned, they do try to close their year with retailers. It's because your know, end of the year is very busy with returns, blah, blah, blah. But also to working capital tends to be at a low. You build up inventories for Christmas, then you sell everything. So, you know, January 31st, everything uh, should have been settled. Um, and you know, by the end of January, everything should be settled. And you, um, you know, your working capital should be at a low. But even with that, that varies widely. It's, it's interesting on conference calls with companies, analysts often hone in on this and they'll be like, what happened with working capital this year? And not necessarily retails, but other companies will be like, well, you know, we had a large receivable that we just didn't collect. You know, at the end of the, 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 the um, customer is slow to pay or, you know, um, and so, you know, it typically they would have paid us by the end of the year, but this year they didn't. So I guess what I would say is, I have found working capital to be, for most companies, really inconsistent year to year, whether it's negative or positive. And again, what you're really looking for is the usage from year to year is what you're, you're incorporating. But whether it's positive or negative, I have found can be very inconsistent. Now, you have some industries, uh, some companies where it's consistently negative, but still the change from year to year can be very different. So um, even with a company like Toys R Us, where it should be relatively negative, again, it goes back to purchasing power. Your know, customers pay cash, inventory they probably had, maybe no longer, a lot of power over their suppliers. So they could be like, you know what I mean? Ship, uh, we're going to keep minimum inventory. We'll send it to us just in time for us to sell it. And meanwhile, we're going to take our sweet time paying you. So they probably had a lot more power than, say, a tiny toy uh, store in my town. But long story short, um, these guys, you know, typically with some industries, you'll see negative uh, working capital, and that's probably a good thing. But you will see swings where it swings positively. And sometimes in some years, it's, um, you know, in this case, it looks like it was a buildup of inventory. Because if you look at payables, they were relatively flat. Uh, accrued expenses were down a little bit. Um, but it really looks like the change in working capital uh, the, the fact that it swung from negative to positive really had to do with the fact that inventories went from 2270 to 2476. So that goes back to the slide with inventory days and how inventory days were growing. So in other words, they had inventory that wasn't moving. So that's a very long-winded way of saying a couple of things. I found inventory year to year, even in industries where it's typically negative, it can swing positive one year. Sometimes that's a sign that something is going wrong. And in Toys R Us's case, you know, uh, inventory days were growing. Uh, and inventories grew here, which is what led to having positive working capital instead of negative. But even if it's not, uh, sometimes it's a one-time thing and it's just something where we took delivery of inventory earlier on something this year than we had expected. So what I tend to do is look at the trend. So when I'm looking at a distressed company and their working capital usage, I will calculate their net operating working capital, really the change in working capital. Uh, not This is really net working capital. It's not the change. But the change in working capital, I will calculate over like three to five years and it'll swing wildly, but I'll get some sense of how bad it could be or how good it could be, how much a source of cash it could be and how much of a use of cash it could be. So that was a very long winded answer of saying this is not unusual. In Toys R Us's case, it probably indicated that there was trouble to come, but it's not unusual to see stuff swing from negative to positive and then back again just for some tiny timing issue, some customer who paid late, some customer who paid early, some shipment they took early or late, et cetera. 
Okay, great. Um, we had a couple other working capital questions. Um, yep. One from Dina in terms of uh, quote unquote other current assets and other liabilities, should, should those be included in uh, that working capital, Shelley? If they're current, if they're current. So other current assets and other current liabilities. So we had a question in the forum the other day, somebody had done some detective work and they had found in other current liabilities was dividends payable and I think interest expense payable. I would probably exclude that. I, I usually don't hone into that level. A lot of times companies will disclose that. So in their current liabilities, they will say, um, you know, instead of just lumping it into other current liabilities, they will say dividends payable, they will delineate dividends payable and interest payable, um, which is should be considered financing, not operating. So in which case I would leave that out. But yes, typically I just uh, lump in receivables, inventory, prepaids and deferred taxes. And if they have other current asset, I throw that in there as well. Same thing on the liability side, payables accrued, income taxes payable because income taxes have to do with the operations. And if they have an other current line, I'll usually throw that in as well. Again, if you are, you know, savvy enough, enough of a detective that you went to the node and discovered there were some things, other current liabilities that you probably wouldn't, wouldn't include, take it out. I don't think and I'm not grading these things. I don't think you would get dinged for that. I would view that as a good catch. But, you know, um, typically I just, when I'm calculating working capital, I just throw in other current liabilities. Uh, and again, most companies help you out by making sure they indicate that, you know, they use dividends, they put dividends payable on a separate line, the interest expense payable on a separate line. I hope that answers your question. But I do include other current assets and other current liabilities, not other liabilities, not not other assets. It has to be something that is above that current line. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, okay. One more on working capital from Jeff. Uh, yeah. Jeff, Jeff says, hi, Shelley. Could you help me uh, understand how to interpret working capital? Some regard, um, the higher the working capital ratio, uh, sorry, so, uh, the higher the working capital ratio, the higher the financial power and expansion, creating a competitive advantage versus those with low working capital, how to read negative working capital in this context um, or working capital should be read into expansion potential. So it's kind of a broad question, but just, I guess maybe just in general, how you think about it. Yeah. You know what, again, what I would say is it's two very different things depending on your perspective. I've looked at a lot of companies where I'm like, okay, this thing is going belly up. Let me see how much they have in terms of inventory and receivable. Cause if I'm particularly a bank, but also if I'm a bondholder, if this thing, and let me say this, most companies are worth more alive than dead. So, um, you know, typically you want to see a company restructure, but your worst case scenario, like Toys R Us, they're closing everything. Everything. So somebody's actually going to be going in, taking the toys off the shelf and selling them shelf and selling them to a discount or like, you know, dollar stores or something like that, a Marshalls or something like that. So as a lender, I like to see a lot of inventory and receivables because it means there's something for me to liquidate so I can get paid back. But from the company's perspective, it is not doing Toys R Us any good to be holding a lot of inventory because inventory means cash is tied up. Um, it doesn't help their expansion, expansion. It gives lenders something to lend against. But if things go the wrong way, you just do not want to have a lot of cash tied up in inventory. You don't want to have a lot of cash tied up waiting for customers to pay you. So, um, you know, all I can say is I think the only benefit of having a lot of carrying a lot of inventory and a lot of receivables is because lenders feel comfortable lending to you. But if things go wrong, it's not going to help you. Uh, you're much better off with negative working capital. Now, lenders don't want to see negative working capital because then they have nothing to liquidate. They have no collateral. So having lots of inventory and receivables, lots of collateral makes lenders happy. But from an operating perspective, it doesn't necessarily help you. It, it's, okay. it's a negative. If I'm sitting here, I bought this inventory and I'm sitting here with it and it's not selling. I have tons of it, you know? And so that's a problem. I have receivables, you know, I've sold stuff to GM or whoever, they're not paying me. And meanwhile, I have to pay my workers. I have to keep my lights on, et cetera. That is not helping my operation. So there's nothing from an operating perspective that is good from having high working capital. It's really not. The only thing you can say is that banks will lend you money because there's lots of collateral. And there are things called borrowing-based revolvers, which are tied to 
inventory and receivables. So a bank will say, you know, I will lend you X, I will lend you an amount of money that's equal to, you know, 80% of your receivables and 50% of your inventory. So it may allow you to get more capital, but it's not efficient from a, uh, from a business perspective to be carrying a lot of inventory and receivables. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Shelly. Let's, let's uh, sneak a couple more in here. On, uh, can we go to slide 20, please? Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's see. So Michael's question is um, for the ratios on slide 20. Um, besides trending, should we uh, um, sort of, you know, looking at how those ratios are trending uh, on a annual basis, it, you mentioned is one way to look at it. Should we also try to compare that to um, competitors? And then if we, if we do for Toys R Us, you know, which ones would you recommend? Michael's suggesting Walmart, Target, Bed Bath, or, or kind of wh who, who would you think about? Yeah, so um, you're absolutely right. Great question, and you're absolutely right. You cannot just pick up a ratio and go, okay, this is good or bad. You have to look at the trend, and you have to look at compared to the industry. Toys R Us is a toughie because they're a specialty retailer. And so, you know, you could look at Bid Bath, you could look at other specialty retailers, uh, but they're so unique in that they're highly, highly seasonal. So you're really talking about, you know, um, stuff, you know, really 80% of their sales is at the end of the year. So they're really highly seasonal. So I don't know if I could compare turnover or days inventory outstanding of a Toys R Us and a Bed Bath & Beyond because it's definitely different type of inventory. Um, but I guess you could compare it to other specialty retailers, even though what hurt them is really Amazon and, um, well, Amazon, I, I don't know, I guess they carry inventory, I, I, I guess. Um, but um, even if what um, the disruption from Amazon, Walmart, and Target is what took Toys R Us down, you can't really compare them because it's all toys versus everything else Target has going on from curtains and clothes and handbags and whatever, and the same thing for Walmart. So you can compare it, but it really is not an apples to apples comparison because you know they're strictly toys and the, even the people who disrupted them are not strictly toys. So that's a toughie. Um, you can find maybe other, uh, I'm trying to think of, I can't really think of anybody to compare Toys R Us to. There are probably maybe some specialty toy retailers that you could look at, uh, but that's a toughie. So I think with Toys R Us, it's really about the trend. And you can make a case that, um, that, you know, if you compare the inventory days outstanding to a Target or a Walmart, that they're a lot less efficient. I just ha not, don't happen to know what their ratios are. But if, you know, if I'm Toys R Us, I can make the case, well, what I sell is totally different from what those guys do. You know, you can't compare turnover with to on toys to turnover on curtains and, you know, this more varied stuff. So I, I think you look at it. I don't know if you could totally hang your hat on it, but what you can hang your hat on is the trend. There's no denying that the trend is going in the wrong way. So, you know, now it's a lot easier to compare a Sears to Target and to a Walmart. That's a fair comparison. And, you, and nobody could argue with you on that. So Toys R Us, I would compare it, but I wouldn't quote unquote put, you know, I wouldn't have put all my you know, bet everything on the comparison of days inventory outstanding on toys versus Target, because two very different business models, but there's no denying the trend was negative. Okay, great. We'll take two more, Shelly, and then we'll, then we'll let you go. Is that all right? That's fine. All right. Um, uh, Dina had a, had a follow-up uh, question, question on fixed assets. Uh, why do we include uh, Goodwill in the calculation of fixed assets in the net fixed assets? to gross to fixed assets ratio. Uh, we don't have any disclosure on the impairment of goodwill and often it fluctuates. Yeah, and you know what? I'm going to bounce that question. Okay. Um, I don't very often do fixed asset turnover. I put it here. I don't even know if I included goodwill in that one. It's just not a ratio that I use. So I threw it in here because I know it was something that we use. I don't remember whether Toys R Us had a lot of goodwill on the balance sheet or not. I just can't remember. So I'm going to punt that question and defer that because uh, it's just not a ratio that I use. I wouldn't have thought that you would, but again, it's not a ratio that I use. So somebody certainly 
certainly could, you know, the professor could, you know, he's a PhD in accounting, could certainly slap me around and go, you know, absolutely not, you're, you know, you know, you're wrong, and this is why you do it. So I, I definitely be open to that. I just don't use that ratio a whole lot. So I don't, I don't, I can't, you know, justify why you use goodwill, you wouldn't good use goodwill, etc. I, I just don't have enough insight into that particular ratio. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, great. We we can discuss that uh, in the forum if you if uh, if you'd like to pick that up uh, there, Dina. Uh, Bresna just had one I, I can, I think, answer this one. Is operating cash flow, cash flow from operations the same thing? The answer is, is yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Any, any, would you, uh, any color to that or? Um, you know what? Um, no, people usually use them interchangeably. Okay. Um, so you're saying operating cash flow or cash from operations? Was that the, the term? Yes, yeah. Yeah, people usually use those in, interchangeably. Um, it, as long as that operating is in there. Now, if you say just cash flow, then it gets a little bit more nebulous because are you talking mm. about taking out CapEx? Are you talking right. about taking out other things? But as long as you say operating cash flow or cash from operations, I tend to use those interchangeably. As long as the word operating is in there, you know that you're talking about something before you get to CapEx which is investing, you know, before you get to dividends. If you just say cash flow, that's a different animal. But right. cash from operations are operating cash flow pretty much the same. I think people use those interchangeably. Right. Yeah. I, I'd say, you know, word operating is the, uh, is the, is the operative word there. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. And then uh, we'll wrap it up. Michael just had one question on um, leverage uh, effect and two different formulas. Uh, Related to Gremlin, Michael, if you, you, let's pick that up in the forum, actually, if you wouldn't mind asking, because I know uh, there, there is, uh, it's easier to explain that in a, in a written uh, format, kind of the, the approach there. We can, Britta or, or Shelly or Fabrice can, can clarify on that. Um, but let's just take one more uh, big picture one for, from Michael to wrap things up. Shelly, I guess putting on your distressed hat, um, Michael's asking for, for Toys R Us, there were news reports that some of the more profitable stores could be formed into a new company. It mm -hmm. seems the debtors may not allow this and maybe saving the brand. Uh, people are promoting this. What do you think? Okay, so I'm sorry. So the company is saying no to that. And I haven't followed Toys R Us closely. It's an um, amazingly complicated capital structure. I just never got involved in it. So I guess the, the question is... Yeah, I guess the question is, is there a way to kind of, you know, sort of liquid all the stores and then, and then, you know, carve out the top performing ones and either rebrand it or, 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 or tweak yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, that, that certainly sounds possible. The whole goal of the bankruptcy court is to maximize the return to creditors. So they're going to do if, and, and, and what it comes down to is creditors and creditors are the bondholders, the bank debt, et cetera. And then the, you know, the company, which is called the debtor. Um, the, the bankruptcy court will look at a plan from the company and the creditors or from the debtor and the creditors have to vote on it. And the, the ultimate consideration is what gives creditors the maximum recovery. Most companies are worth more alive than dead. Um, retailers may be different because you can liquidate the inventory. Most of them have a lot of inventory, you know, unfortunately have a lot of inventory. So as a, a creditor, I don't mind seeing that and I can liquidate that and get paid back. But maybe the best recovery to creditors is some combination of liquidating a bunch of stores, selling that inventory to somebody like a Marshalls, you know, mm -hmm. who can liquidate it. And then you have a small group of stores that, you know, restructured and you get some equity in those stores. But it all will depend on on a plan from the company that the creditors will vote on. The company puts forward a plan, the creditors vote on it, and the, what the court considers is what will give creditors the best recovery. So when, under which scenario will they make the most money? Right. And it could be very much a combination of that. I'm not sure why anybody would oppose that. Um, you know, creditors probably wouldn't oppose it, but I just am not enough into the details. But what I will do is look at some of the recent news reports and I'll take a look at it. It's possible that, and what I will say is this, and the last thing I'm gonna shut up, is a creditor, what you want back is cash. So, you know, you may say, you know what, 
an inventory actually can be sold for a pretty penny, almost a hundred cents on the dollar. It didn't used to be that way, but it is now. And think about it. If I'm a, a, in a, a retailer and I sell luxury sheets or any kind of sheets, say a set of king size sheets, 600 thread count or whatever goes for a hundred bucks. I buy them for 50 because a typical retail markup is 50 is a hundred percent. So I bought them for 50. So I'm a retailer. I have them in my inventory at $50. That's my cost. The re typical retail price is a hundred dollars if i can if i go under there are people who do liquidations for a living they could easily take that set of sheets sell it to marshall's for the for exactly what i paid for it and marshall's can mark it up to 75 dollars and make make plenty of money so you can really make a lot of money in uh, liquidating certain retailers inventory so what you may have is a situation where creditors have said just in, like liquidate this puppy and give me my cash. Because if you restructure into another company, I will get stock. And I have no idea how that company is going to be run, how that stock is going to trade, et cetera. I just rather liquidate this puppy and get my cash and go on about my business to my next deal. So that could be a reason why creditors would prefer a liquidation, but that's really particular to retailers. Most companies are worth more alive and continuing to operate than, than being liquidated. It's a very kind of special situation with, uh, with retailers. And again, Toys R Us, I don't know enough. They can have real estate. So as a professor pointed out, you know, real estate is, you know, it's on the books for what you pay for it, but it could be worth a lot more. So if I'm a creditor, I'm like, you know what? Sell off the headquarters, sell off the real estate, sell off the inventory. We can probably get a hundred cents on a dollar exactly what it's on the books for and give me my cash. I don't know how to value. I may or may not be able to value the equity that I'm going to get in this new specialty boutique Toys R Us brand, but I know how to value cash. Um, you know, I definitely can value cash. So give me my cash and let me go on about my business. Maybe one reason creditors don't like that plan, um, but I'll do some reading. Maybe creditors are coming out with the opposite. So I'll do some reading and I'll post something in the forum. Great. Um, good stuff, Shelly. We had uh, one from, from Keenan, which is um, low specific, but I think we'll wait on that just just because people are wrapping up the case, as you, as you mentioned, sorry, Keenan. We'll, we'll pick that up uh, next week, actually, once the, uh, everyone's submitted their questions. Um, Shelly, great job. Okay, good. I enjoy it. Love talking about this stuff. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, you guys found this uh, useful. Uh, you know, we like to do one of these uh, per course as sort of a, you know, a wrap up to, uh, you know, you know, use Shelly's expertise to provide some uh, real world examples and some examples from uh, her career. Um, so I appreciate everyone's time today. Uh, good luck uh, wrapping everything up with the uh, case study and grading everything next week. And uh, we'll be in touch. Thanks, everybody. Thanks Take care. Everybody.